Hey guys, welcome to another special episode. In today's video, we are going in depth to talk about everything you need to know about frozen fish food. In today's video, we have Jason from San Francisco Bay brand Brian Shrimp as an expert to help us understand and answer all of the questions that we have about frozen fish food. Now, I've done a few of these videos in the past where we go for a deep dive into a specific topic and we invite an expert on to help us answer those questions. Jason is that expert in this case from San Francisco Bay brand. They have been making frozen fish food for a very long time. Before we get started, I want to make sure that you know that this video is not sponsored. However, San Francisco Bay brand is giving 100 people the chance to win a frozen fish food delivered straight to your door. So stick around to learn more about that, how to enter to win a frozen fish food, and stick around to learn more about everything you need to know about frozen fish food. All right, so let's get started. First off, let's introduce Jason. Jason has been with San Francisco Bay brand for quite a long time. We are great friends and he knows a lot about fish food and specifically frozen fish food. So Jason, welcome to the program. Hello, Greg. It's great to be back. I've been with San Francisco Bay brand for almost 18 years now. Prior to that, I worked in local fish stores for 10, and I operated a small aquarium maintenance business on the side. But today, we're here to talk about frozen fish food, so let's dive in. All right, so let's start with the most obvious question, which is why is frozen fish food such a good option for feeding your fish? Well, we recommend feeding frozen because it's all natural. That means it contains no preservatives, no dyes, and no fillers. It's also evolutionarily appropriate because it resembles what fish would feed on in the wild and it triggers an instinctive feeding response. Okay, that makes sense. So can you explain the difference between a single ingredient food versus a formulated uh, frozen food and give some examples of each type? Single ingredient foods, as the name suggests, contain only one ingredient is a food source. Those products may also include water, binders, or thickening agents for packaging purposes. Single ingredient items include brine shrimp, blood worm, mysa shrimp, squid, and krill. Formulated feeds are either species specific diets or diets that have been developed to serve a general purpose, such as feeding herbivores. Angel and butterfly formula, which is a specific to marine angels and butterflies, contains sponge. Our emerald entree product is an herbivorous, omnivorous food which can feed reef tanks, African cichlids, as well as freshwater fish such as silver dollars, mollies, or swordtails. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, most of the fish foods that I feed, frozen foods, uh, tend to be the single ingredient foods. I like things like brine shrimp, uh, blood worms, things like that, single ingredient foods. But I can definitely see where a formulated food would also be helpful, especially if you're just keeping a, one specific type of fish that has a very specific diet. Now, you mentioned quite a few examples there of different types of frozen fish foods and how they're prepared. I'm assuming they come from all over the place. Can you explain uh, where some of these foods come from and how they make it into a frozen cube form? Well, your assumption is correct. Our ingredients do come from all around the world. They are collected from areas where they're found in high concentrations and easily accessible. For those items that we do not harvest ourselves, we we'll either contract someone to harvest for us or they're items that are readily available for human consumption. Each item has its own special processing procedure, but for instance, something like a cyclops would be processed much different than squid. Cyclops is a small and delicate animal and needs to be handled with a little bit more care as not to damage the body of the animal during cleaning and processing. Squid are received whole with the beak and ink sacs still intact, which we remove. One thing we do differently with our squid than squid that is for human consumption is we do not bleach the squid. Normally for human consumption, squid would be uh, bleached with peroxide or another solution to remove the outer skin. We leave it on. This gives the squid a, a purplish hue and it seems to be a real good attractant for fish. 
The way that they would make it into a cube is something like a cyclops is packaged as the whole animal. Something like squid would have to be chopped down to a size that would be able to pump through the pumps or get sucked up through the pipettes and then pumped into the cubes. The cubes are formed by plastic going down the rail on the machine. Form, uh, a mold is uh, used to form the cubes. Then the pipettes or pumps would fill the individual cavities. And then that slides underneath a sealer which places the foil on top. As that comes off the end of the machine, it is cut into the size of a 100 gram package. Okay, that makes sense. Now, what are some of your favorite frozen foods and what would you feed those to? As you know, I've worked for San Francisco Bay brand for quite some time now, which has given me the opportunity to try and use all of the products that they make. To narrow something down to my favorite foods would be difficult because it depends on what it's being fed to and the application it's being used for. So for simplicity's sake, I'm going to narrow it down to one single ingredient food and one formula food. On the single ingredient side, I'll have to go with Cyclops just because it's growing in popularity and it can be used in marine and fresh water. On the marine side, it's excellent for planktivorous fish such as Antheus and on the freshwater side, it's excellent for feeding smaller fish such as tetras, rasboras and quarry cats. As far as formula foods are concerned, I'd have to go with emerald entree just because it also feeds a wide variety of fish in both marine and fresh water. Excellent for a reef tank, not only to feed your omnivorous and carnivorous fish, but it will also offer supplemental feedings to your herbivores. On the freshwater side, it's excellent for African cichlids, silver dollars, mollies, and swordtails. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the formulated diets. I think the single ingredient foods sort of speak for themselves. It's a single ingredient, but the formulated foods seem like they're really geared towards a specific fish. Can you give some more examples of what those type of formulated foods are and how they are so specialized towards that specific fish? As mentioned earlier, formulated feeds are either species specific or they serve a generalized purpose. Some of the main differences between the formulated feeds and our single ingredient items are formulated feeds contain more than one ingredient. They also contain vitamins, minerals, and amino acids. Many of them also contain specialty ingredients such as sponge or anacharis. We make quite a wide variety of formulated feeds some of them have uh, applications for both fresh and saltwater fish, and others are specific to uh, marine or fresh water. You know, on the marine side, we've got marine cuisine, which is an omnivorous and carnivorous marine formula, as well as our coral cuisine, which is one of our newest formulas. That contains a variety of zooplankton, phytoplankton, vitamins, minerals, and amino acids to meet the needs of stony corals. On the freshwater side, we make a product called Cichlid Delight as well as Beef Heart Plus. The formulation for those products is almost identical, except for the Beef Heart Plus contains Beef Heart, which is considered to be fatty, even though we trim all the fat from the Beef Heart before it is mixed into the formula. The Cichlid Delight is the same exact formulation, except Turkey Heart, which is much leaner, is substituted for Beef Heart, so it's much healthier for the fish. Yeah, okay. And I mentioned that uh, I like feeding a lot of single ingredient foods. Specifically, I love the frozen brine shrimp. I love the frozen blood worms. A lot of the fish that I keep and breed are live bearers. And I know that a lot of fish benefit from frozen foods in order to condition them to start breeding. Um, if you're just feeding flake food once a day, those fish probably aren't going to get fat enough in order to, um, you know, produce eggs and give birth to fry. Can you explain why frozen foods are so good for people who are trying to breed fish? Frozen foods are a good choice when conditioning fish for breeding because they are nutrient rich. They are often high in proteins and fats. The most commonly used frozen foods amongst fish breeders are brine shrimp and blood worms. Although these are usually incorporated into a feeding regime that also includes a high quality pellet or flake. Okay. And in terms of um, the different ways that frozen food gets packed, I'm familiar with two. I'm familiar with the blister packs um, and the flat packs. Can you describe a little bit more uh, about the similarities and differences between those options and uh, who should use which one? 
When frozen fish food was first introduced, it was only available in flat packs. That's why San Francisco Bay Brand's range of frozen brine shrimp flat packs has so many different sizes. It used to be available from 2 ounce all the way up to 32 ounce. But as the popularity of frozen fish food cubes grew, some of the smaller sizes were discontinued. Frozen fish food cubes grew in popularity due to their convenience and ease of use, as well as them being designed to float and slowly break apart, allowing fish to feed at all levels in the aquarium. Flat packs are often used by people who have multiple aquariums or by breeders because it's less expensive to buy frozen fish food in bulk. Okay, and for the people who are feeding a lot of frozen fish food, what is the most uh, cost-effective way of going about buying frozen food? What form factor does that frozen food take? For people that use a lot of frozen fish food, the most cost-effective way to purchase it is in bulk. We offer bulk in two forms. Many of our single ingredient items are available in 12 or 32 ounce flat packs. Some of our formulated foods, enriched brine shrimp, and single ingredient foods are available in what we call a roller cube. It's 216 cubes perforated every two rows, so it offers food in bulk with the convenience of a cube. Okay, yeah, and I know with flat packs where it's a big sheet of frozen food, uh, it can be a little daunting for someone that just has a couple aquariums to be able to chop that up and to uh, feed that to their tanks. Seems like the, the blister packs uh, with the little cubes are a lot easier to just sort of go down the line and feed your fish. But can you explain some tips and tricks with the flat packs? Uh, I know they are a really good value. It's just a, a little bit harder to prepare that um, and use that. Can you explain some, some tips and tricks on on how to best approach a flat pack and uh, chop that up into the correct portions and feed your fish? When it comes to feeding frozen flat packs, it's going to depend on the food item itself and possibly the application for which it is being used. Certain food items such as your krill and your silver sides are whole animals and are often a little bit easier to break off with just your bare hands. Some people will choose to take a flat pack, cut open a corner, and just wave it over the surface of the aquarium water allowing pieces to break off into the aquarium. Some people also prefer to cut it with a knife. Although I will say you should exercise caution when using this method because the knife can easily slip on the frozen or wet product. What I often like to do is take the flat pack, scoot it over to the edge of a counter and hit it with the butt of my hand to break off a piece. Those pieces broken off from flat packs can either be introduced to the tank while still frozen or they could be thawed out in a cup using some aquarium water and then poured into the aquarium to feed the fish once thawed. Alright, and what about the people who are going to their grocery store and just buying human food, frozen uh, seafood or something like that uh, off the shelf? What is the, what is the difference between going to, say, a grocery store to buy food for your fish uh, versus buying specifically prepared frozen food from a pet store? When people purchase frozen food from the grocery store to use in their aquarium, they really need to exercise caution. They could contain preservatives or flavorings that could have a negative impact on the aquarium and its inhabitants. Companies that manufacture fish food specifically for aquarium use obtain their ingredients from trusted sources as well as put all their foods through rigorous testing to make sure they're safe for aquarium use. One thing that I've noticed is um, the differences between like the guaranteed analysis on something like a flake food or a pellet food versus a frozen food. They seem very different. Um, can you explain sort of the, the differences between those two things? Guaranteed analysis must appear on a package on an as-fed or an as-is basis. This has a little impact when comparing two products of similar moisture, such as two frozen products. But when you try to compare a frozen product to a dry product, there could be a large discrepancy in the moisture content. Frozen products could have anywhere from 90 to 95 percent moisture, where a lot of your flakes and pellets have a 5 to 15 percent moisture content. According to the FDA, they suggest that you compare these on a dry matter or a dry matter basis which would mean reducing the percentage of moisture in the analysis to zero. 
There are formulas available that allow you to do this accurately, as well as several calculators available online where you can just simply plug in the numbers and it'll spit out the values for you to compare your products. We also have this information available on our website at sfbb.com under the tips and hints section. All right, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's a little bit of a math lesson there, but yeah, if a product is frozen, it's got a lot more moisture in it as compared to if it's a flake food and all of that moisture has been removed. So point taken, I think that's really good information to help people out. All right, now we talked a little bit about where some of these foods come from at the beginning. Can we talk a little bit more in depth about what the process is like, how a fish food, a frozen food gets from the place that it was caught in the wild or harvested uh, from a facility grown uh, and gets all the way to the consumer. Can you, can you explain sort of what that journey looks like in a typical sense? You know, it's actually quite an exciting journey. Obviously, each ingredient goes on its own journey before it makes it into the fish food and before that fish food makes it to the end user. But fortunately, I had the opportunity to watch this entire process with brine shrimp. Of course, it requires getting up quite early in the morning to go down to the ponds and watch the fishermen begin the day. They would go out on their rafts, harvest the brine shrimp, collect it, and then put it into five-gallon buckets. Once the raft was full, they would take that raft to shore where it would be unloaded. Those buckets would then be carried to a pickup truck. That pickup truck would be filled two or three layers high with the buckets, and then they would be taken back to the facility in Newark, California. From there, once they reached the facility, they would be placed in the holding tanks where they would be purged and clean. Some of those brine shrimp may be dedicated to being enriched with spirulina or omega, Others would be dedicated to being just a regular brine shrimp product. After that, the brine shrimp would be clean. Once clean, they would be prepped for packaging. Now, once they were ready for packaging, they would either go into a, a cube package or the flat pack package. Once they were put into those packages, the packages would then be put on trays, and those trays would then be put on racks. They would either be placed through a freezer tunnel, where they would be frozen with CO2, or into a freezer cabinet where they would be frozen with CO2. Once frozen, they would be removed and either cased out in the case of flat packs or in the case of cubes, they would then be placed inside their cardboard sleeve and then the final packaging would be put into the uh, inner pack carton, which is the little white box you sometimes see them in in the pet shop inside the freezer. Once in there, they'd be put in the master cases and then those master cases would be loaded into our holding freezers where they would wait for an order to be placed. Once the order is placed, the frozen fish food is then loaded onto pallets. Those pallets are then loaded onto a reefer truck and either taken to a distributor or a zoo or a public aquarium. You know, obviously, once they reach the zoo or the public aquarium, they're then placed into the uh, feeding regime of those animals. And then from the distributor, the distributor would then place them on a truck in a cooler or a freezer and then deliver them to the pet stores where they would be placed in the display freezer for the hobbyists to purchase to feed their home aquarium. <laughs> All right. Well, that is quite the journey. And I guess now it makes sense why frozen food is a little bit more expensive than some other types of foods because it has to remain frozen all the way on that journey, all the way until the point where you're ready to feed it to your fish. All right, now let's talk about preparing food. Let's talk about feeding frozen food to your fish. Now, sometimes when I feed frozen food, especially if it's the blister packs, and I'm being a little lazy, um, I just pop those cubes out and they go straight into the water. Do you have to thaw or pre-thaw your food before you feed that frozen food to your fish? It is not necessary to thaw frozen food before feeding it to your fish. As a matter of fact, our frozen cubes are designed to be fed while still frozen. They will float for a period of time, start to break apart, allowing fish to feed at their natural feeding levels within the aquarium. Even if a fish is large enough to swallow the entire cube in one gulp, it will not harm the fish. 
We also do not recommend thawing frozen foods in the microwave or hot water because it will break down nutrients contained within the frozen food. All right, can you give some examples of uh, some frozen foods that are good to go right as they are, just drop them straight in the tank versus some that um, do better with a little preparation or some thawing beforehand? Well, you know, as I just discussed, the thawing of frozen cubes is not necessary and they've actually been designed to be fed while still frozen. Although there may still be some instances where people choose to thaw frozen food, we recommend you do that in a cup of your aquarium water. For instance, maybe you have a reef aquarium and you have some inhabitants or corals that require target feeding. You may want to thaw the frozen food before you feed those. Some people who use flat packs that have multiple aquariums will thaw the flat packs and then go around and use a uh, syringe or a baster to feed their aquariums throughout the fish room and it's a lot more convenient to have that food thawed out in a bucket or container while you're doing so. Other instances are you may when you're feeding say frozen silver sides or frozen krill because they're larger items and there's actually parts of those that may be sharp and could cause internal damage to the fish so it's always a good idea to thaw those out before feeding them to your fish. All right, so we've got our frozen food and we're ready to feed it to our fish. There are a lot of different ways to actually feed that frozen food. I've used things like worm cones, um, which keeps that food suspended and out of the substrate. I've used things like a turkey baster to be able to spot feed uh, and get that food exactly where I want it to. Can you talk about some of the preferred methods for feeding frozen food and a few examples. We've both just discussed some of the more common ways of feeding frozen food to your fish. Obviously our preferred method for the frozen cubes is to feed the cubes while still frozen. But as you mentioned some people also choose to take the frozen blood worms and put them in a cone which allows fish or amphibians to come and feed on those as they wish without them getting lost in the gravel or sucked up by the filter. Some people may also choose to thaw the food, pour it in front of a circulation pump or power head to broadcast feed a reef aquarium, and also target feeding with the pipette, syringe, or turkey baster is another common method. Other than that, there may be some specialized fish that people are trying to feed and they need to try some other techniques to get them to eat. Maybe they're a finicky eater, maybe they have a particular feeding habit. Uh, you know, one common thing I see now is uh, people will take a piece of PVC pipe and drill a bunch of holes in it, put some frozen mice or shrimp in that PVC pipe, and allow uh, marine angels and butterflies or other finicky marine feeders that may uh, pick around at the reef. They may be coralivores. It just simulates more of a natural feeding habitat for the fish, and so they will instinctively use their natural feeding habit to feed upon those foods. Okay, so you mentioned a, a thickening agent uh, using seaweed for those blister packs to keep those uh, cubes sort of intact for a little bit longer versus the flat packs where um, there are no thickening agents. Can you explain what that means in terms of the nutrients that are added to the tank and you know the palatability of that food and um, what those effects might be? The thickening agents we used are used for packaging purposes and product performance. For packaging purposes, it's used to keep the product from settling out so it can be easily distributed into our cube packaging. For product performance, it allows the cube to stay stuck together a little bit longer so it floats and slowly breaks apart, allowing fish to feed at their natural feeding levels. These binding agents have no negative impact on the water quality and it does not seem to affect the palatability of the product either. All of our cube products do include some form of thickening agent. All of them are a plant derivative, and one of the more common ones we use can be commonly found in foods for human consumption. All right, yeah, and you mentioned uh, overflow boxes. So I guess that's a big consideration with a saltwater tank with a lot of flow. Uh, you have a sump, you've got a filter sock. You don't want to pop some frozen food in your tank, have it remain floating, and then go straight down your overflow box because your fish aren't going to get a chance to eat it. Can we talk specifically about saltwater tanks and how to keep your frozen food out of an overflow box and what would you recommend? It may be desirable to shut off the return pump on tanks with overflow boxes to prevent the food from going directly into the filter. 
Now, DC pumps are available, which will allow you to reduce the flow without completely turning off the life support system. Whichever method you choose is fine. If you have a reef aquarium, you may choose to shut off the life support system, but leave the circulation pumps on. This would allow you to thaw food, dump it in front of the circulation pumps, and broadcast feed the aquarium. When it comes to a fish-only aquarium, there are different methods that could be used. You may be feeding clams on the half shell, in which case they would sink directly to the bottom of the aquarium. There are also several varieties of frozen fish food feeders available that would also prevent the frozen fish food from going into the filter if you chose not to shut off the life support system. All right, now, I know a lot of people will just feed just a flake food every single day, and that's sort of the baseline. That's what they feed their fish, uh, and they don't think a whole lot about it. Can we talk a little bit about what you would recommend in terms of how often to feed frozen food and how to work that into the daily or weekly diet of your fish and your aquariums? Frozen fish food can be used as a daily diet, as part of a daily diet, or a treat. Some aquarists may only choose to feed their fish a couple times a week with frozen food, while others may want to incorporate it into the daily feedings because they're feeding several other foods and they feed multiple times a day. Our general recommendations on feeding fish is to feed them from anywhere to one to three times a day what they can consume in three to five minutes. The amount of food you feed and how often you feed your aquarium is going to depend on many factors, depend on the type of fish in the aquarium, the size of the aquarium, and your maintenance schedule. You're best to consult your local fish store to figure out what works best for you. All right, picky eaters. I know a lot of times, especially when you introduce a new fish uh, or a fish that is shy or a fish that is still trying to acclimate to its surrounding, sometimes they don't eat. Um, and sometimes you just have a finicky, picky fish. And frozen food seems to be a pretty good option for a lot of those fish. Can we talk a little bit about picky eaters and how they react to frozen food uh, in your experience? Frozen fish food is an excellent choice for finicky feeders. It retains its natural shape and scent, and it has a familiar look that fish are used to because it resembles what they would feed on in the wild. Two of the most commonly used foods to entice finicky feeders are frozen mysis and frozen bloodworms. These tend to release a lot more juices into the water that have an attractive scent that will draw the fish to the food. Yeah, okay, scent. That, that makes a lot of sense because if you think about fish in the wild, right, they are picking up on their surroundings and they are feeding based on cues that they get from their senses. It makes sense that scent would be one of those things and that a frozen food would be packed full of that scent. And I can only imagine what bloodworms smells like when it hits the water, right? There's just all that protein there and the color and it just must look fantastic in terms of uh, a food source and to stimulate that feeding response. Totally makes sense. Um, one question that I hear a lot about frozen food, and this specifically comes from the saltwater side of the hobby quite a bit, is around phosphates. A lot of people seem like they're afraid to uh, feed frozen foods heavily because they're afraid of adding additional phosphates to their aquariums. Can we talk a little bit about phosphates and frozen food and what the impacts there might be? Yeah, this is always a um, big topic of debate, but you know, to simply break it down, all living things contain phosphates, which means any ingredient derived from a living thing used in a fish food contains phosphates. Therefore, all fish foods contain phosphates. Now, when it comes to frozen foods, they generally have a phosphate level of 0.05 to 0.1, where the majority of your dry fish foods, such as flake and pellet, have a phosphate level of 1.0 or higher. Of course, if you wanted to get an accurate comparison, you'd want to go back and do a comparison on a dry weight basis. That said, the amount of phosphate found in frozen foods is negligible. It's often believed that the binders or thickening agents used in frozen fish foods contain high levels of phosphate, and that's simply untrue. There has been independent research done studying this, and the amount of phosphates found in any fish food is negligible. 
Rinsing frozen fish food does not do anything to benefit your aquarium, and it actually washes away beneficial nutrients. All right, let's talk about water in frozen fish food. Is water added to frozen fish food in the manufacturing process? Can we talk a little bit about uh, the importance of water in a frozen fish food mixture? Yes, water is added to all of our frozen products. Uh, the number one reason is for packaging purposes, so the product is distributed evenly throughout the package during the packaging process. Another reason it is added is to help prevent freezer burn due to minor temperature fluctuations, such as when you open and close your freezer door. By adding water to the product, this is a process commonly referred to as glazing in foods for human consumption, what that does is it puts a layer of ice over the product so when the water evaporates through sublimination, the water on top of the product evaporates first instead of the water inside of the product, which helps to prevent freezer burn. Another reason water is added to the products is for product performance. As I mentioned earlier, the frozen fish food cubes are designed to float and slowly break, break apart. By adding water to the cubes, this allows the cubes to float for a longer amount of time as they warm up and melt in the aquarium. Water is also added to our flat pack products for product integrity. This makes sure the products are nice and rigid and don't get damaged during shipping. All right, now in terms of buying frozen food, how can you tell if frozen food has remained frozen through all of the steps of its journey. How can you tell if that frozen food is still good before you buy it? As the manufacturer, we take many precautions to make sure frozen food stays frozen throughout its journey. During shipping, we use trackers that monitor temperatures that will alert us if there have been any fluctuations. It can be a little bit more difficult for an aquarist to tell if a product is thought upon purchasing it. With flat pack products, they may be disfigured bubbly or lumpy. When it comes to cube products, it can be a little bit more difficult to tell. Even if the product isn't a color that you're used to it being, does not necessarily mean that the product has been compromised. Remember, we use natural ingredients. These ingredients come from a wild environment. Their color can be affected by environmental changes or by what they have been feeding on. The best thing for an aquarist to do is if they suspect the product may have thawed out is to give it a good smell once they get home and open it before they feed it to their fish. Now remember, these products don't smell good to begin with, so what you would want to compare it to is maybe seafood or a meat product that has gone bad. But remember, if there is any doubt or question in your mind, consult the local pet store, send us an email, contact us on Facebook, or give us a phone call and we'll be happy to assist. Ah, uh, yeah, the good old sniff test, tried and true. Um, that's really good advice, and I think that leads into the next question, which is about power outages. Frozen food, if it's in your freezer and you lose power for an extended period of time, what happens? How long can you hold on to it? Can you refreeze it? When should you just throw it out? During a power outage, you should treat frozen fish food the same way you would treat frozen foods for human consumption. If the product still has ice crystals and has remained at 40 degrees or lower for less than two hours, it would be safe to refreeze. It may compromise some of the nutritional value of the product, but it will not harm the fish. If it has gone above 40 degrees or remained under 40 degrees for more than two hours, throw it out. As always, if there are any questions that it may not be safe to feed to the fish, throw it out. It's always better to be safe than sorry. All right, and speaking specifically on the topic of bloodworms, I know that I have a bloodworm allergy, and so whenever I feed frozen bloodworms, I always make sure to wear gloves uh, so that my skin doesn't come in contact with the bloodworms. Now, I know you're not a medical professional and you can't give medical advice. However, can we talk a little bit more about bloodworms and the bloodworm allergy since it seems like it's only something that occurs uh, around fish keepers who are handling bloodworms. If you find yourself sneezing, getting rashes, a runny nose or itchy eyes after handling bloodworms, that means you have an allergic reaction to bloodworms. You should consider feeding your aquatic pets other foods because the reaction will get worse with each exposure. 
oftentimes people who have a, an allergic reaction to seafood will also have an allergic reaction to bloodworms. All of San Francisco Bay Brand's bloodworm packaging does contain an allergy warning. Okay, cool. Good to know. And in terms of someone trying frozen fish food for the first time, where should they go? How should they get started? What should they try first? For people that have never tried frozen fish food before, I would say don't be afraid. Try something new. Fish love variety. A great place to start is your local fish store. They're likely to have a freezer stocked full of frozen fish foods as well as knowledgeable staff that can help you choose one that is correct for your fish. Many people often start with items such as brine shrimp, blood worms, or mice shrimp. Or they may choose a formulated food such as freshwater frenzy or emerald entree. For those that wish to offer their fish or aquarium a variety of foods, we also make what's called a multi-pack. We have a freshwater multi-pack, a saltwater multi-pack, and a reef multi-pack. Each multi-pack contains four varieties of food, which allows you to offer your fish a variety without taking up a lot of space in your freezer. All right, that's about it for my questions on the topic of frozen fish food. Now, I promise there would be a contest, so here it is. You can find the information in the description of this video, but within one month of this video being posted, you can go to the link in the description down below to fill out a very quick survey, learn a little bit more about San Francisco Bay brand frozen fish food, and enter to win one of 100 frozen fish foods that we're giving away, shipping straight to your door. So definitely don't miss that. Go check that out down below. All right, Jason, thanks for spending time with me for talking about frozen fish food. It's great to be a fish nerd. It's great to get in depth with these topics and get real information from the experts that have it. Now, if someone wants to learn more about San Francisco Bay brand and all the frozen fish foods that you guys offer, where should they go? Well, Greg, as always, it's been fun hanging out with you as well. For anyone that wishes to learn more about San Francisco Bay brand, they can visit sfbb.com, where we have a full product listing, including ingredients and analysis, as well as many resources, including feeding guides, tips and hints, and videos. Okay, good to know. Now, as we wrap up, Jason, do you have any final thoughts or anything that we may have missed in terms of questions about frozen fish food? Well, you know, we've covered a lot of topics concerning frozen fish food today, but one thing I would like to remind people is that frozen fish food is raw and unprocessed, and therefore they should take the same precautions as if they were handling frozen raw foods for human consumption. Anytime after you feed your fish frozen fish foods or do anything with your aquarium, you should wash your hands when you're done. All right, Jason. Well, thanks for the time. Thank you for coming on the program to help answer all of these questions. It's great to be a fish nerd. It's great to get all of these answers from a reputable source. So thank you very much, and I'll see you on the next video. Thank you as well, Greg, and as always, I enjoyed coming on to answer your fishy questions. San Francisco Bay Brand also thanks you for the opportunity to come on and discuss frozen fish food. All right, guys, and that's going to do it for this special video. Everything you need to know about frozen fish food. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this format, sort of a longer Q&A video series, asking experts the information that we want to know about aquariums and fish and our hobby. If you did, give this video a thumbs up. If you haven't already, subscribe to this channel. And if you want to help support this channel, you can always go check out myaquariumbox.com. Hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you guys later.